Hello my darlings, it's Zui here and today I'm delivering chapter 2 of Be With Me Forever which is, uh, well technically overall the story is the second time I dive into the fantasy AU of uh, Boku no Hero uh, and technically the third video with the fantasy AU, it's complicated but I hope you enjoy it just as much as you the first part and I hope you enjoy it just as much as I enjoyed writing it but before we dive right into it, uh, please watch the video until the end, like or dislike, and comment something down below. If you don't know what to comment down below, just tell me how your day was. Um, this is the best way how you can support me, as this way you can make sure that my videos will plop up in more uh, recommended feeds of other people. And they might watch my stuff and enjoy it. I'm getting a lot of comments of people saying I'm underrated. I'm getting a lot of people saying that my stories are better than certain rivals of mine. And uh, yeah, I hope uh, you share my stuff around. Would really, really appreciate it. Now please, enjoy the show. The Red King, Bakugo Katsuki, was to be married to you. One of the three Lord Necromancers. This was all to save the three kingdoms from a threat beyond the Veil of Death. The recently resurrected Demon Lord. It had been the idea of Emperor Mineta, leader of the Dwarven Empire in the North. It had been vehemently opposed by the High Elf Council. But the humans of the Kingdom of Lyre and the people of the Fire Tribe settled the vote in the favor of this arrangement. Lord Necromancer Oleg, the patriarch of this powerful family of mages, demanded one of the leaders of the Free Kingdoms to marry his beloved grandchild. Bakugo volunteered to be the, as the elves had put it, Sacrifice for the greater good. With all these rumors about the dark mages he had expected to be turned into the guinea pig as soon as he crossed the border into the twisted realm. But that didn't happen. While well, yes, he had been knocked unconscious by a pack of scouting ghouls, he had been safely brought into the necromancer tower of Al Majik, the home of the three lords. To a surprise, the tower was more akin to a castle, built upwards rather than to the sides. It had countless hallways and even more rooms and levels. Travel happened mostly through teleportation stones and elevators. But so far these were only things he had heard from you. Outside of you and your personal ghoul servant, he hasn't seen a single soul yet especially a living one. Many tales spoke of the town's cursed inhabitants, half-finished undead abominations and insane cultists. But with the exception of rather frighteningly large abominations made of flesh and or metal, everything seemed normal, all by very dark and ominous. Master Bakugo! said your ghoul. The half-undead creature having brought his breakfast. The Honorable Lady wishes you to explore the tower, but not yet to leave its halls until the marriage is completed, or she or her grandfather say otherwise. Bakugo shrugged, and with an aggressive grimace, simply asked, What's the hold up, huh? The ghoul placed the silver platter with a delicious-smelling sticky honey roast on the table in his room. Master Bakugo is not familiar with the customs of his soon-to-be wife, I see. I shall inform the honorable lady. The ghoul bowed awkwardly before huddling outside, saying a hushed farewell before closing the door. Despite his initial rejection of this entire ordeal, the fact he got served meat on a daily basis was something he enjoyed. 
The Fire Tribes, despite their primitive and aggressive nature, were talented farmers, managing to grow almost any crop in the dry badlands they called home. But due to the badlands being quite dry, it was rare for a hunting party to return with enough meat to properly feed everyone. After finishing his delectable meal, he got on his feet. Despite his curious nature, he had refrained from leaving his room. Mostly because you had told him to wear the necromancer robes you had been given before he'd be allowed to exit his room. But it looks like his persistence had paid off, and he could leave in his tribal wear. With a pounding heart, he left his room. Looking around the dark hallways he found himself in, the necromancer tower had been built out of dark granite bricks, and almost every furniture item had been made out of perfectly cut obsidian. The furniture in his room alone must have been more worth than an entire nomad camp, including its people. If it wasn't for the admire, if it wasn't for the admittedly pleasing design, he would have called it an act of such utter decadence that he would have gladly smashed them. He slowly began walking to the right. The hallway's ground was completely covered by a red velvet carpet. Black candles and torches sparkly sparsely lit up the way in front of him, each one having an eerie green fire emitting from them. He heard of this kind of flame. They were called night lights. The reason was simple. Water or cold or wind could not eliminate the flame. The only way was to snuff it out by covering it entirely by a heat-resistant material. However, he did not know how to create nightlight himself. Maybe it asked you should he get the chance. Eventually you reached what was seemingly a dead end in form of a wall and a teleportation stone. A numbered panel stuck out of the ground right next to it. With one finger he moved the numbers on in With one finger he moved the numbers on it. Zero zero one. Then he stepped onto the stone and pulled at the lever that stuck out from the panel's side. For a moment that felt like minutes, he felt like he was free-falling until he suddenly hit the ground with his feet. He hated teleporting. The level he found himself on, which he hoped was the ground floor, was a large circular hall, decorated with stained glass. A large door led to what was most certainly the outside. But it was the inside that intrigued him. It was empty with the exception of what appeared to be two people talking at the opposite end of him. One of them, a man in a gold decorated blue robe, instantly noticed his arrival and dropped his conversation to approach him. The other figure simply stood there unmoving, unbreathing. Must be a zombie or ghoul. Ah, uh, excuse me, said the rope man after coming into arm's length of the Red King. You must be on your arrival. Bakugo shrugged. Who made you think that? Your rugged clothing. Of course. Every person in Almagic was either insane or a mage. Bakugo must be sticking out like a sore thumb. But he was too proud of his heritage to care if anyone judged him for it. The man crossed his arms. My, my, you are an interesting specimen. The last time I have seen a barbarian was in the form of a severed head one of my automatons had brought back. He snickered. You people should really make sure not to accidentally cross the border. Bakugo felt heat immediately rise up to his face. Lucky for him, he knew better than to lash out immediately. 
I admire your willpower to not immediately punch me. Like one of your... orcs. Bakugo could see the man's shit-eating grin under his hood that covered almost all of his face. Oh, where are my manners? The man gave a quiet cough before revealing. Mm -mm. My name is Isaiah, Lord Necromancer of the Mechanicus. And you, <laughs> he chuckled, are the leader of the Fire Tribes, Bakugo Katsuki. I'm glad the Free Kingdom sent a human. Our grandfather would have been very offended if they wouldn't have. Bakugo scoffed. Right. Earning him a glare. You really should be more impressed. In his rag of audience to someone... Like you. The dramatic pause before Isaiah said, like you, almost made Bakugo throw up. What? I'm almost glad that a man like you become part of our family. You certainly are eye candy. Isaiah licked his lips. The other, however, remained stoic and refused to comment. Hmm. If you ever decide to ditch these uncouth clothes of yours, and my sister isn't quite to your liking, meet me in my laboratory. I promise. I won't bite. And with that, he swiftly strutted past Bakugo, dialed in what was most likely the number of his lap, and with a condescending Arrivederci, he teleported away. Now, Bakugo was alone. Even the zombie or ghoul Isaiah had been talking to had vanished without a trace. Not that he cared. But this little interaction was already enough to ruin his day. But one piece of the conversation stuck with him. Mechanicus. He repeated it in his head. Maybe he understood less of your family, and what you creed of mages was actually all about more than he initially thought. Bakugo decided he would deal with this when the time came. For now, he had a city-sized tower to explore. The next few hours he spent dialing random numbers into the teleportation stones and exploring the different halls and dark passageways of the Necromancer Tower. To his surprise, it was ironically more lively than he initially thought. On many floors, ghouls were delivering supplies, and people in robes who didn't pay many attention were chatting between each other. Occasionally, he'd see an animated skeleton or a zombie shuffling around. It was alien to him to see one of these things not immediately be out for blood, especially the skeletons. He himself had been tasked many times with the eradication of the suddenly reanimated. It really did feel like a town condensed into a single building. How someone could maintain order here was still a mystery to him. But then again, maybe it was devotion to the cause. Or maybe these people were just as insane as the people in the surrounding town. He made a stop at what seemed to be a floor entirely dedicated to physical training. Countless training dummies in various states of use Weights that, by the looks of them, he could lift with a single finger. Obviously, the people living here had more brain than brawn. There weren't that many people here to begin with. Despite that, he felt a certain calmness here. The fact that there were so many things to expel your overflowing energy on to become stronger almost made him feel like home. From a stand with training weapons, he took a wooden battle axe and walked over to one of the training dummies. He took a few swings at it, only to realize that it was actually an automaton. 
It didn't attack, but took a defensive position. Bakugo scoffed internally. The machine was completely taken off guard by his speed and strength, has probably never fought an actual opponent before. If his axe wasn't made of wood, by now he probably would have chopped it to pieces. Then he risked a large over-the-head swing, and blam! The machine had punched him straight in the face. Knocking the wind out of him, he took a step back. Hey, aren't you supposed to just defend? He growled. But now that he was actually facing an opponent, he felt joy. For so many days, Bakugo had been utterly bored. Finally, he could hit something again. Unleashing a war cry, he charged again. The longer he fought the automaton, the quicker it became. It did have the tendency for quick jabs that were difficult to dodge, but unlike the face punch he received earlier, he could easily take them, no sweat. After he managed to block a blow heavy enough that it would have probably knocked him out, he heard clapping behind him. For a split second, he snapped his head towards this distracting noise. A few people in ropes had gathered, watching the spectacle. They probably had never seen a fight like this before. A person with actual skill versus an opponent that gained skill at a much faster pace than anything he'd ever seen before. It gave him a sense of pride that he hadn't felt in a long time. All he did so far were basic moves and having fun. This was nothing like the arena brawls within the barbarian strongholds. Pressing the advantage of Bakugo's distraction, the automaton had closed the distance. Now it was too close for him to swing his axe. Bakugo was barely fast enough to dodge the machine's following punches. Thinking quickly, he let go of the axe and grabbed one of the machine's extended arms and threw it over his shoulder. The crowd oohed and ahed. The machine remained on the ground for a full five seconds. It was probably trying to simulate the pain it was supposed to feel right now. Then it rolled on his chest and very awkwardly stood up. Both man and machine raising fists for a simultaneous punch. His hand connected with the automaton's wooden face first. And a fraction of a second later, the leather ball that was the machine's fist crashed onto his. He saw stars. I knew he'd have a pounding headache soon. But he was happy. Then his back hit the floor. He didn't even realize he got sent flying. And he couldn't help but laugh. Then Bakugo lifted a sore head. The machine, once again, was lying on its back as well. Uh, this was one hell of a fight, grunted Bakugo happily. The crowd started cheering, but instantly got silenced suddenly. My lord, said one of them. He turned his head upon hearing that. The entire crowd of these cowardly scholars was bowing towards a figure that stood in the middle. A red robe, decorated with golden ornaments. It was you. <laughs> hey! He greeted, still feeling the rush from his fight with the machine. I had a feeling I'd find you here, Sir Bakugo. You said, smiling his boy's charm taking the better of you. Then you held out your hand and helped him on his feet. I see you're still wearing your, uh, clothes. Okay, seriously, I don't see why this is such a big deal. I mean, these guys don't mind. He pointed at the still bowing crowd. You crossed your arms and scoffed. It's my brother and grandfather, okay? If they see you running around looking like... Like, Bakugo growled, a primitive. Shrugging, you said, sure, let's use that word. I'd never hear the end of it. Bakugo grinned. Well, your bro called me eye candy. 
You blushed and took an embarrassed step back. You talked to Isaiah? Yeah, I guess. You sighed. Fine, I'll deal with that later. After all, I asked you to explore the tower. I should have expected this. Me lady, said one of the necromancers. Uh, yes. Uh, may I ask, is this the barbarian you're supposed to be engaged with? You nodded. Then each of the figures turned to Bakugo. My apologies, sir, said one of them. If we came off disrespectful, said another. Bakugo was taken aback. We had assumed you'd arrive with your guard, or any people of your kind, now that I think about it. He shrugged. Eh, uh, whatever. No hard feelings? It sounded more like a question than an actual comment. And soon, the crowd dispersed. Leaving him with just you and two ghouls who had accompanied you. I wanted to show you something. It is one of my favorite pastimes. Uh, okay. Guess I'm in. You smiled and then blushed. Good. If we are to be married, I'd like it if at least we are on good terms. So I... I want you to take part in my activities, if that's okay with you. He grinned. <laughs> Why are you so shy all of a sudden? He teased. Uh, b because my brother calls it a waste of time and everyone else calls it too dangerous. I, I never did it with anyone else. Just... Just come, you spurted and grabbed his arm, dragging him behind you without another word.